on World News Tonight. Visa Limbo Afghans in UK visa limbo as Pakistan vows to expel migrants. Suspended United Nations suspended eight of its DRC peacekeepers in response to sexual abuse allegations. Dropped out Steve Scalise drops out of much speculated US House Speaker race deepening the leadership crisis. And Comic-Con. Hundreds of comic fans attend the NYC Comic-Con celebrating all things pop culture. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News this Friday night. A desperate situation is unfolding for Afghan refugees in Pakistan. Hundreds of Afghans who risked their lives to work with the United Kingdom in Afghanistan and fled the Taliban are now stuck in neighboring Pakistan as they wait to be relocated to the UK. Some have said that their days are spent living in fear as Pakistan starts a crackdown on migrants without visas after cross-border tensions rose. Many Afghans worked for or with the UK in some capacity before foreign forces hastily withdrew when the Taliban retook power in 2021. Former translators for the British Army, people who worked on British-led projects to encourage democracy and equality in Afghanistan, all stated that they qualify for the UK government's resettlement schemes. All are in Pakistan because the UK government asked them to come so that they could process their visas. Many stated that they were afraid there could be repercussions for their case or that they or their family back in Afghanistan could be targeted by the Taliban. The Taliban government has said there is an amnesty for former Afghan government soldiers, contractors and translators who worked for international forces. Now, Gaza continues to be hit very hard. There's growing humanitarian concerns in Gaza as food, water, electricity and fuel supplies have been cut off while the wounded are being rushed into hospitals. Palestinians say civilians are the ones paying the price for the Israeli retaliation for the Hamas attack. All this amid a possible ground operation in Gaza should there be a final decision. Just two days after Israel ordered a complete blockade of Gaza, closing off access to electricity, food and water, Gaza has now been left without electricity, as its only power plant has shut down after running out of fuel. The head of the Gaza Power Authority says that people are using generators for electricity, but even the fuel needed for them is running out. Hospitals have also been affected, with a large number of patients currently relying on electricity-powered oxygen generators to breathe. With thousands of Palestinians displaced and in need of medical care in the area, hospitals are flooded with the wounded, many of them children. A plastic and reconstructive surgeon based in Gaza said on Wednesday local time that the hospital is already beyond capacity, but said he will stay in the region as long as it takes. Speaking via video call as explosions rang out in the background, he said hospital supplies are low and electricity is running out. My feeling is that the Palestinian health system it has the rest of the week before it collapses, not just because of the diesel. All supplies are running short. Meanwhile, the Israeli military says it's preparing for a ground operation in Gaza, but added that the political leadership has not yet decided on one. This comes as the country has called up some 360,000 army reservists and has threatened to destroy Hamas with all power, following the militant group's deadly attack over the weekend. While pledging to give more military assistance to Israel, U.S. President Joe Biden warned the nation to follow the rules of war. And there are rules of war. And, uh, and I believe Israel is doing everything in its power to, uh, to pull the country together, stay on the same page, and we're going to do everything in our power to make sure there's a succeed. As Israel's ground operation appears to be imminent, there are growing fears that this could risk the lives of more civilians. Israel and the White House are condemning comments by Donald Trump in which he praises the Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah and blasts his once close ally, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. As the war between Israel and Hamas militants continues, Israel's government and the White House are condemning comments by former U.S. President Donald Trump over the crisis. That includes criticism of Trump's once close ally, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, 
saying the leader wasn't prepared to handle the Hamas massacres in Israel. Just remember how much safer the world was under the Trump administration. And Trump praised Lebanon's Hezbollah group, which has since attacked Israel from the north. You know, Hezbollah is very smart. They're all very smart. The press doesn't like when they say it. Hezbollah is backed by Israel's arch enemy, Iran. Israel's communications minister has said the comments are shameful, hurts Israel's morale and war effort, and that it shows Trump can't be relied on. The White House is calling what Trump said dangerous and unhinged, and that this is a time to stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel. Several Republican challengers for the presidency have also condemned it, including Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who called it absurd. Trump made his comments at a campaign rally in Florida. He also went further, claiming that Netanyahu decided, at the last minute, not to participate in Trump's order to assassinate Iranian General Qasem Soleimani three years ago. Israel was going to do this with us, and it was being planned and working on it for months, and now we had everything all set to go. And the night before it happened, I got a call that Israel will not be participating in this attack. But I'll never forget, I'll never forget that Bibi Netanyahu let us down. And then uh, Bibi tried to take credit for it. Trump made support for Netanyahu's right-wing policies a cornerstone of American foreign policy while he was in office, including moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which greatly angered Palestinians. The assassination of the Iranian general and Trump's pullout of the Iran nuclear accord also brought Washington and Tehran to their lowest point in decades. On Thursday evening, Trump released a statement saying there had been no better friend or ally of Israel than when he was U.S. president. The effect of the Israel-Hamas conflict is being felt around the world, particularly in France, where police used water cannons and tear gas to break up a pro-Palestine demonstration after France issued a nationwide ban on such gatherings. The incident at the Place de République saw demonstrators with Palestinian flags chanting that Israel was a murderer. Authorities say around 3,000 people had gathered and that 10 were arrested. The ban was put in place by France's interior minister, Gérald Darmanin, who said that since the Hamas attack during the weekend, more than 100 anti-Semitic acts have been recorded and people have been arrested for trying to carry knives into synagogues. The minister has also said that any foreign nationals breaking the rules will be deported. France has large Jewish and Muslim communities at around 500,000 and 5 million people, respectively. Next, in the U.S., Representative Steve Scalise, who Republicans picked to be the next Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, dropped out of the race as his party failed to resolve its divisions, sending the chamber into its 10th day without leadership. Opening up the process. Steve Scalise has dropped out of the U.S. House Speaker race, prolonging the leadership crisis in the chamber following the ouster of Kevin McCarthy over a week ago. Scalise announced his withdrawal to reporters on Thursday. I just share with my colleagues that I'm withdrawing my name as a candidate for the speaker designee. If you look at over the last few weeks, if you look at where our conference is, there's still work to be done. Uh, our conference still has to come together and is not there. Uh, there are still some people that have their own agendas. The number two House Republican from Louisiana had already secured his party's nomination for the job and former U.S. President Donald Trump in a Thursday interview said he did not object to Scalise as speaker, though populist hardliners in the GOP have appeared to favor Scalise's rival, Jim Jordan. Still, House Republicans failed to resolve divisions in closed-door talks Thursday and were unable to secure the 217 votes necessary to install Scalise as speaker. Republicans can afford no more than four defections as they control the House by a narrow 221 to 212 margin. Several Republicans earlier said they would stick with Jordan, who lost out in a secret ballot vote on Wednesday. Jordan had encouraged his supporters to vote for Scalise, according to a source who spoke on condition of anonymity. The White House weighed in on the scramble following Scalise's withdrawal. This is the House Republicans, as I've said over and over again. It is their process. The president doesn't have a vote. It is what we're seeing is certainly shambolic chaos that we're seeing over there on the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue, and they need to get their act together. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on behalf of the American people. The Republican infighting has left the chamber neither able to act to support Israel's war against Hamas, 
nor to pass government spending bills before funding runs out on November 17th. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. The latest on the road to the White House now. A new poll of registered voters in Nevada suggests that the state is poised to reprise its role as a key battleground in the presidential election next November. While its first in the West Republican caucuses in February could help to cement former President Donald Trump's hold on the race for his party's nomination. <laughs> President Joe Biden and Trump split registered voters in a hypothetical 2024 matchup in Nevada by a near even margin with no clear leader. 46% support for Biden, 45% for Trump, respectively. The polls' results mirror the tight race seen in nearly all recent national polls, testing initial reactions to a repeat of the 2020 presidential election, where Biden won Nevada by just over two percentage points. Many of those backing Biden in a potential 2024 rematch say their choice would be motivated largely by opposition to his chief Republican rival. Most say that their ballot would be more a vote against Trump, while others say that it would be a more an affirmative show of support for Biden. Nevada could play a central part in choosing a Republican nominee for president next year, with its caucuses set for February 8th, serving as the third contest in the GOP's nomination race. The UN peacekeeping mission in Democratic Republic of Congo has suspended some of its peacekeepers in response to reports of serious misconduct, adding that it had zero tolerance for sexual exploitation and abuse. The United Nations peacekeeping mission in Democratic Republic of Congo has suspended some of its peacekeepers in response to reports of serious misconduct. That was revealed in a statement which also said the mission had zero tolerance for sexual exploitation and abuse. The mission, known as MINUSCO, did not say how many peacekeepers were suspended or give details of the accusations against them. MINUSCO has previously faced allegations of sexual abuse, with the UN vowing to crack down on such behaviour. The statement, released late on Wednesday, said precautionary measures had been initiated in line with the Secretary General's zero tolerance policy. The measures, it added, included suspension from duty and confinement to quarters pending an investigation. MINUSCO has some 17,000 personnel deployed in Congo's east, where various militias and rebel groups continue to fight. Its presence has become increasingly unpopular, for what critics say is a failure to protect civilians. Last month, Congo's President Felix Tshisekedi told the UN General Assembly that he had asked his government to fast-track the withdrawal of the peacekeeping mission to ensure that it begins by the end of the year. Australians will go to the polls on Saturday in a historic referendum that will determine if Indigenous people are recognised in the country's constitution through a new parliamentary advisory board. Sunrise on the final day before the sun sets on the referendum. One day to go. The Prime Minister in Tasmania has the yes side fanned across the country in a last minute, last ditch campaign. When you listen to people who are directly affected, you get better outcomes. This is one of the most significant decisions that uh, many people uh, will be voting on during their lifetimes. Thank you. As Australians voted in their millions in Sydney, a noisy reception for Warren Mundine, leading the no campaign, leaving with no surprises. Thank God it's a secret ballot. <laughs> <laughs> do you think there'll be some healing to do after this referendum? Oh, there's a lot of healing to be done and I think uh, Australians uh, are pretty sensible people. Tonight, a new JWS research poll for the Australian Financial Review shows the no side with a nationwide lead of 57% to 43%. No is leading in all mainland states except Victoria. That would be easily enough to defeat the referendum. It won't be a message of rejection to Indigenous Australians, quite the opposite. We want practical outcomes for people in Indigenous communities. Certain arrogance has crept into the no camp. There is absolutely a pathway to victory. Uh, we're very encouraged by what we're seeing out on the ground. This time tomorrow night, counting will be underway. Both sides adamant there'll still be work to do come Sunday. 
It seems there's no end in sight for United Auto Workers union strikes. Now a top Ford executive says that the company has reached the limit of how much money it will spend to get a contract agreement with the striking United Auto Workers union. Ford says there's not much more it can offer to end a strike at its factories in the US. The stoppage escalated sharply this week when the United Auto Workers Union ordered a walkout at the firm's Kentucky truck plant. That is Ford's most profitable factory, accounting for about a sixth of its revenue. It makes big SUVs that are among some of the company's top earning products. On Thursday, a senior Ford executive said Ford was at the limit of what it could offer on pay, though it could still reallocate money within its current offer in further bargaining. Ford says the Kentucky stoppage could push its supply chain towards collapse, and it says the strike may just slash profits and end up harming workers. But UAW boss Sean Fain insists Ford and other big automakers can do better than the current offer of pay rises of up to 23%. Our strike is working, but we're not there yet. He's expected to make new comments in a video address on Friday afternoon. In recent weeks, he's often announced new walkouts at that time. Last week, he said the union could target a General Motors plant in Texas that makes some of the firm's high-end SUVs. Potential targets at Chrysler parent Stellantis include plants making its Ram pickup trucks. Welcome back. At least seven people were killed when a suspected human smuggler lost control of a van carrying migrants in Germany. For more on this story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in Kyrgyz capital Bishkek to take part in the summit of the Council of the Leaders of the Commonwealth of Independent States. German police stated that at least seven people were killed and more than a dozen others were injured when a suspected human smuggler lost control of a van carrying migrants in southern Germany. The nuclear-powered USS Ronald Reagan and its strike group arrived in South Korean port of Busan for a five-day visit in a show of force against North Korea. New Zealand Labour Party leader Chris Hipkins will lead the polls on October 14th with high hopes that his election campaign is enough to retain his position as the country's Prime Minister. Eclipse enthusiasts from near and far gather outside New Mexico's International Balloon Fiesta grounds ahead of the annual solar eclipse. The eclipse due to be visible along the park covering parts of the United States, Mexico and several other countries in Central America and South America. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. We're leaving you tonight in the US as comic book fans descended on New York for the annual Comic-Con. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.